Testing, 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 testing. Okay, I heard this. No sound, no sound. Do we have sound now? Testing, testing, please. Okay, good. All right. Yeah, I always forget something, and I very much apologize for that. Always something. Okay, yeah, because I put on my mic, but I forgot to click the button to connect. There we go. Okay, <laughs> take two. Sorry about that, everybody, but yes, hello and welcome, everybody, to Cast Iron Wednesday here once again, where we get to play with Cast Iron here on YouTube Live, because, you know, what could possibly go wrong doing cooking on a live video channel? <laughs> anyway, yes, thank you very much for letting me know that, and yay, thanks to everybody as well for being kind enough to show up here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that's not the first time that's, that's happened either, but I can only thank everybody. Um, Thank you for being here, folks. Hello to Beth Button and to Cast Iron Fanatic. Howdy, folks. Happy Cast Iron Wednesday. Ah, uh, yes. Um, and hello to uh, Flash1499 and 4Jim44 and William Hurt and Cynthia Wesley and all you uh, folks who have been kind enough to show up here again on this channel uh, for some reason or another. And, and again, it really means a lot for uh, you folks to be here. Uh, but that, of course, is because we all enjoy our cast iron. And especially, yeah, that gives me an excuse to play with my cast iron on here uh, on YouTube Live each week. Like for starters, let's let's take a look at what we're looking at tonight. How about once again my huge mammoth Birmingham Stove and Range number twelve size Dutch oven, which I have heating up on the stove top right now, so that we can uh, start preparing some uh, stew here. So there's a starter for you. Um, and my prep work is uh, just about almost done, too. Actually, it is practically done. There's only one last thing I need to do right now, and that is to uh, mix up one last bowl of stuff here. Um, I posted the recipe for this uh, particular dish, pumpkin stew, already. And, and if folks have uh, taken a look at that, you'll see that I find it's pretty convenient to prepare four bowls of our, uh, of our ingredients. And right now I'm working on the very last bowl, which involves one, um, one cup of yogurt. And let me quickly dig out, here it is, here's a spoon here. There we go. And with that, we can put this aside. I'll have to put this back in the fridge. And let's quickly dig out one can of diced tomatoes, and then all of my other prep work is uh, done. And a good thing, too, I started it earlier today. I've cut up and marinated some chicken. I've uh, cut up a whole bunch of tubers, including um, squash, actually pumpkin, in fact. Um, uh, what was I? Oh, yeah. Squash. Uh, there's also potatoes and sweet potatoes in here. I've chopped up some uh, onions and uh, red bell pepper. Chopped up some mushrooms. Yeah, that's the thing about these these dishes, especially it seems like Indian dishes from India, that is, in that they always seem to have about 5,000 ingredients in them. <laughs> and from what I hear from India, typically they say there's 5,000 ingredients and there's a god for each one. <laughs> okay, um, let's throw this out right now. But anyway, I have just mixed up at this moment. Um, a cup of uh, a can of diced tomatoes and a cup of yogurt because again indians indian dishes usually uh use a lot of yogurt and this one is certainly no exception so there's a start but there we go and that pretty much completes all of the prep work which means we, once we've done this we can just uh, get the stew going uh and i'm hoping to have this um i'm hoping to start this part as quickly as i can so that uh Hopefully, everything should be ready by the time this uh, video ends, and that's my hope here. All right, yeah, all the colors of the kitchen. Yes, exactly. So now that we've done that, we get to move over once again to the uh, BSR Dutch oven here. In fact, let me see. I'm thinking maybe I should even raise this a little bit more so that you folks can uh, get a better view. There we go. Again, this is a huge Dutch oven here. This thing is 13 and a half inches across. So this is uh, pretty big. Fortunately, it looks like it's already hot enough. So that means we could start off 
with the chicken. Yeah, as I said, I've uh, cut up a, about a, about two and a half, maybe three pounds, and probably two and a half pounds of chicken breasts. And there's a starter. Okay, which means it's also been marinating in spices for the past uh, few hours or so. And now we get the chance for it to hit the hot iron. And go from there. All right. I'm not going to, I'm, uh, I'm not going to completely cook this chicken because again it is going to stew, but nonetheless it's always good to brown it. So yeah, that's what I mean. This is like uh, probably at least two pounds of chicken, yet because this uh, pot is so big, there's plenty of room to move it around. And I certainly like that. That's one reason of several that I like using this huge Dutch oven here. But anyway, um, let me see. What's this somebody commenting? Where is Brimfield? Well, that's interesting. Okay, yeah, my large Dutch oven is so small. Yeah, I've more than once I've put a number eight size Dutch oven into this pot and with the lid and everything, and I've been able to completely close the lid on this pot and completely uh, have that um, that smaller Dutch oven for breakfast. Now I love my number eight Dutch ovens, <laughs> plural. I have at least three of them. So, uh, but even so. Again, using a really, really big cast iron pot like this is a lot of fun. Now, as I mentioned before as well, that this is a uh, Century Cookware Series BSR Dutch oven. Um, in fact, this one, I feel most likely had been salvaged from a house fire because, in fact, this uh, Dutch oven is fire damaged, unfortunately. Even so, I'm determined to get as much use out of it as possible at least until the day comes when I can find a Red Mountain series Dutch oven number 12. All right, yeah, I'll tell you. Swallows it whole, yes, number 12. I think he said that was a number 12. Yes, that's exactly what this is. If, you, um, if anybody brings up any of the uh, websites that actually have the size uh, measurements for uh, Birmingham Stove and Range, then you will see that this, in fact, is again about 13 and a half inches across so yeah this is one huge bleeping uh pot which is why i'm glad to be able to use it to uh sear up uh, this chicken here and then once we do that uh, i want to use my bsr number 12 dutch oven but i would have to use it outside or in the oven yes exactly so uh, this is, fortunately, I'm glad this is a full-size oven, a uh, stove, that is. Uh, I don't think this is an especially large stove, but it is a, a standard size stove, and I'm quite happy about that. Yeah, carrying this thing around is a lot of fun, uh, Val, no question about that. But even so, I mean, as, since I have this pot, I'm determined to give it as much use as possible. And that's also why I'm hoping... That on Halloween, which is next Tuesday, oh, good grief, is it already next Tuesday? But yes, I'm going to do a special show on um, on Halloween and make gumbo, or at least that's my hope. There we go. I kind of let the cat out of the bag, but that's next week. Right now, though, what we are doing, nonetheless, is uh, chicken. Uh, this chicken was has been marinating, as I mentioned, all afternoon. And uh funny thing is, I, even though I put some oil here, I guess it seems to have absorbed it. I think I may actually have to throw a little bit more in. So let's uh, do that as quickly as possible here. All right. That was something I wasn't expecting. Well, all we can do is compensate for it. There we go. Now I'm starting to hear the hear what I want to hear. And anyway, all I'm trying to do is brown this chicken right now as it is. Hi. Uh, hello, JD Hive John. Just got here because I thought I set up notification. Yeah, YouTube notifications are notoriously unreliable, unfortunately. 
There are a few channels that I'm subscribed to. I don't get notices of new videos until several hours after they premiered, which is a shame because that means, you know, the comments section already has like 100 or 200 comments on them. So it kind of uh, takes some of the fun out of it. Maybe three inches of snow by Friday morning. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Here in New York, we are entering one, probably one last bit of Indian summer, it seems like. The temperature actually, it, if it didn't make 70 degrees today, it was close. And apparently it's going to be uh, in the 70s for at least the next couple of days or so. So, of course, we are determined to enjoy it as much as possible. I turned off the heat this morning, and I'm quite happy about that. You know, save just that much more on my gas bill. All right, what do we have here? I'll change spaces with you for Jim. <laughs> Hello, uh, rights, Trump policy, and rocket caver, and D Pell Pal. 85 here in New Orleans. Oh, yeah, sure. Rubbing in our faces, why don't you? <laughs> you need to push the notification button before it comes on. Yeah, at least three days of seven days. Yeah, South Seas Cat. Any difference between a cauldron and a Dutch oven? As a matter of fact, no. Uh, a Dutch oven is a modern day cauldron, and I am not exaggerating about that because you see, if you look up the definition in the dictionary of a cauldron, you will see that a cauldron is actually a big cooking pot, and that's it. So, pretty much any big pot really is a cauldron. Of course, people have a thing when cauldrons are when you use the word cauldron, immediately the thing that comes to mind is something ancient and um, you know from medieval times uh we're talking about those round huge cauldrons and that's usually what people think of first but in fact as i said a dutch oven is in fact a modern day cauldron because it can do everything those uh, medieval cauldrons could do um i mean you know i mean you know, again you can make uh, great potions in it which is exactly what i'm doing right here of course, those huge cauldrons in the olden days were, in addition to making family dinners and the like, they were also meant for washing clothes. Fortunately, I don't have to wash my clothes in this uh, BSR Dutch oven, thank goodness. <laughs> but that's the, how things change. And yeah, actually, I think I'll comment on that. Because uh, folks who uh, follow the cast iron treasure hunt should know that we have seen cauldrons uh, all even you know, in our uh, hunts for, for uh, cast iron. And there were quite a few of them made here in the U.S. between, say, the 1800s all the way up to about the first part of the 20th century. And uh, there are a number of them out there. And, and you can usually, not always, but usually tell the age of the cauldron based on its ears. And I pointed this out before, you know, the veil that the cauldron hangs on. Uh, the older cauldrons from the mid 1800s and earlier usually had flat top ears because that's how they were that's how they were cast. A flat top ear and then going down. Whereas on the other hand when the uh, when molding te technology changed, uh, then it became more common for them to have rounded ears. And uh, that is usually one way to tell when a cauldron is more recent from, like, say, the uh, 20th century or so. Uh, they usually kept their gate marks on them, even all the way up into the 20th century. So just having a gate mark would not necessarily guarantee a cauldron would be uh, 19th century. On the other hand, um, again, technology and, uh, was introduced in the 20th century that essentially made cauldrons obsolete. Because, again, what we mentioned was that the two biggest uses for cauldrons were, of course, for cooking, especially cooking large amounts of food, and washing clothes. And, yes, I know there are other regular uses for cauldrons as well, especially things like rendering lard, for instance. And they continue to do that probably all the way to the present day. But those were the two biggest things, you know, because everybody had to wash their clothes. And then, of course... Wood-burning stoves came in in the uh, late 19th century or mid or later 19th century. And, of course, they were a fixture in just about every household by the early 20th century. On the other hand, of course, washing machines came in, especially electric washing machines, to the point where by the uh, early to 20th century or so, uh, cauldrons were effectively obsolete. 
And that's the reason why they stopped making huge cauldrons in the U.S. You know, there was no need for them. There was no market for them now because there were, there were stoves and washing machines. Also, I think they were beginning to introduce refrigerators as well. Um, but that's the real reason why they don't make huge cauldrons, as many anyway, anymore. Um, I would hazard a guess that cauldrons finally stopped being produced sometime around, well, maybe the Roaring Twenties, at the very latest, the period before the um, Great Depression. I don't really have any documentation to back this up, though. This is an estimate, and I could be wrong. But I'm basing this just, you know, based on what we know of, well, just that, of how washing machines came into uh, favor in, with the uh, technological revolution in the U.S. of the early 20th century. You know, when electricity and gas um, came into uh, just about everywhere, and so, so many items went electric. All right, so anyway... Florida's temp graph is like a heartbeat monitor graph right now. Oh, yeah. I remember scalding kitchen chickens in a big iron pot in the mid-60s. Also used in hog butchering. Yeah, that's another thing as well. Um, um, was it, I think it was Herbert Hoover, in fact, who uh, his campaign slogan was a chicken in every pot. So there you go. Anyway, at this point, I probably uh, seared this chicken enough. Which means, let's uh, get it out of here. And then we get to move on to step two. Uh, I got to do this as fast as I can. Okay. Yeah, even though this is plastic, I don't think this will be a problem. There we go. This is a somewhat bigger ladle. Anyway, there's some more about cauldrons, and especially with Halloween here, of course, this is the season for cauldrons. <laughs> so I hope I didn't bore you too much talking about that one subject. All right, there we are. There's step one. Now from here, we go on. Uh, I think we need a little bit more oil in here as well. And now it's time to go on to step two, the aromatics. And this is on diced onion and diced red bell pepper, which of course are necessities. Regrettably, I should have also included some diced ginger, but unfortunately, yet again, I'm out of ginger and I'm mad at myself for that. I honestly checked the uh, fridge this evening for ginger and was shocked that there was none. So I'm going to have to rely on ginger powder tonight. Anyway, all I'm trying to do is sweat this until it becomes, you know, as they say, starts becoming soft and translucent, at which point then we get to move on to step three. And this is pretty much your standard for any stew here. So even though this is a chicken curry stew, it's really no different from any other stew you might make in a Dutch oven or, or a uh, big pot. Yeah, and as you can see, we start off with the meat, move on to the aromatics, then we'll be adding the spices, then will come the vegetables, and finally the rest of the chicken and a whole lot of water. So there's really nothing to it. I'm ready for step two here to hunker down. When someone says, Okay, I'm, yeah, I'm just glad me and my friend were talking about uh, cold, oh, cauldrons. Um, okay, well, all right. for some reason, chicken and beef kind of lost its flavor since, since the 70s. Uh, I might disagree with that, but maybe it's because I grew up, on I grew up in the uh, 70s and 80s and 90s. So, I've, so pretty much all I've had is chicken and beef from that time. But... And then this, I guess, kind of comes to another subject that I did that I mentioned in a, a short video just yesterday. Um, I'm not a heavy spice person. You know, I have all grown up. I basically my entire life, I have been in eating my you know chicken and beef 
and vegetables and all that with with not a lot of seasoning and spices in them. Um, and I, I, it's only because I enjoy the natural taste and flavor of things like uh, chicken without a lot of spice. I, I like it that way, but a lot of people don't. A lot of people prefer their chicken with a whole bunch of seasoning and spices in them. And that's why one of my friends has mentioned that and said that she wanted chicken with a whole lot more seasonings. So I certainly uh, did my best to, uh, you know, accommodate her when I made a uh, chicken, you know, when I made some uh, chicken breasts the other day with a lot of seasoning on them. And I have to admit, they tasted pretty darn good. I will not deny that. Yeah. That's also one reason, another reason why I'm doing a curry chicken tonight, because there's definitely seasoning and flavor in this. Hey, I have so many spices. Yes, that's the other thing. Since we have so many spices, we've got to be sure to use them. I think the further west you go in the U.S., the spicier things get. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think you can say that, too. Or south, for that matter. When we get into Cajun country or, uh, or Texas or Mexico, that's when the spices really get interesting. I mean, heck, you know, you know, in Texas where you can't go five feet without seeing another barbecue uh, sauce or rub. You can add flavor without heavy heat spice. There is that. And that's, but again, I'm hoping that's why, you know, since we're doing curry chicken tonight, I want to be sure we can taste the curry. Anyway, this stuff is already starting, I think, to get uh, into uh, the, uh, point where uh, that i want the uh, chicken no the chicken the onions are definitely changing color and i would have to say they are most likely beginning to soften up so that means now comes step three and that would be the spices which funny enough i was just talking about what a coincidence oh. the spices used here are of course curry duh uh, cilantro, cumin, ginger powder, and cayenne pepper. Huh. So yes, indeed, it's essentially it's the same as the uh, Cajun Trinity here, and I've just thrown in a whole bunch of spices to go with it. And now that we've done that, we are definitely getting close here now, because now we can put the um. Uh, what else? Oh, yeah, that's right. Then after this, in addition to all that, now it's time to add those tomatoes and yogurt. So that that way we're going to have some actual sauce in this. Mmm. Nice. There we go. We definitely have the base for our stew now. Mmm, boy, I can smell those spices, that's for sure. All right. And with that mixed in, here comes the chicken once again. Yeah, we're just about at the point where pretty soon all we'll have to do is just build, just cover this and let it stew for at least an hour. My hope is it'll only take about an hour or so. Because we are already 25 minutes into this thing. So I can't take too much longer here. Anyway, here's the chicken. And so finally, we got a whole bunch of veggies here. What we have are pumpkin, in fact, uh, along with diced potatoes and sweet potatoes. So there we go. A lot of everything here. Let's mix it all together as best as we can. And then I think we're going to have to add some liquid. And here I goofed again. I should have gotten at least one extra container of chicken broth. But I forgot, which means we're going to have to settle for water, unfortunately. Oh, well. Nonetheless, at least, if nothing else, I do have some chicken broth. So there are a couple of cups here at least, and 
Actually, that chicken broth has done uh, not bad. It's only partially uh, covered it. Here, of course, this time we do have to cover the whole thing, um, which means I better quickly uh, get some more water from the sink. There we go. And then once we do that, I'll be able to settle in and chat with you, with all you uh, fine people for at least a few minutes before I get to uh, preparing the other part of this. And that's the pumpkin itself. All right. There we go. Looks like we are just about ready. Oh, yeah, there will be one more thing as well. I'm going to also have to throw in some flour to, ch to uh, thicken the stew. So maybe I'll let it come to a boil first before doing that. But there we go. We are off to a start. Now, of course, again, we've got to get this thing to boil. I mean, it's time to add the lid. Ugh. All right. Phew. Okay. Beauty W, I love the seasoning, but can't find it anymore. Mm. I cook sugar pumpkins, uh, the Beaumont resident. Do you have any experience with Le Creuset cast iron from France? Um, yes, actually, in fact, for about um, eight or nine years or so, I had a huge Le Creuset uh, enameled Dutch oven. And that was one of my first uh, scores, cast iron scores, in fact. I found that huge 13-quart Dutch oven at a flea market for six bucks without a lid, and the enamel was not in the best condition, which must be why they were selling it for only six bucks. But even so, I was glad to scoop that up, and I uh, used it re very regularly for the next several years or so until the enamel finally started chipping, which meant, unfortunately, it was time to uh, upgrade. Can uh, Gary, Paul, and I get a shout out from you? We're here in England. Really? Oh, well, congratulations, and, and thank you very much, Deep Beaumont resident. I'm very, very flattered. Gary, and Paul, and um, Deep Beaumont resident, yay. Yes, hello, England, here from the USA. I, as I said, I'm very, very flattered here. Here's hoping that you have uh, get some uh, use out of your own cauldron between now and Halloween or pretty much any other time. So thank you so much. I'm sworn to secrecy. It's the code. <laughs> but I'm flattered. Uh, I think once there was somebody on this channel from Asia, but... Um, I'm, but I guess they haven't really stayed. So it's really flattering to see someone from Europe here. So, yeah. Hi, Rick Stumbaugh and Pat Z. What are you guys cooking these days? Yes, that's always a good question as well. Um, because, uh, well, what can, uh, again, having a big pot like this means using any excuse at all to use it. And that's why I'm more than happy to be doing so. Um, this uh, this uh, Dutch oven, for the record, is a uh, Birmingham stove and range. The lid is an older Red Mountain Series number 12 lid. Uh, the pot, on the other hand, is a uh, not-so-old Century Series Dutch oven, and I talked about that earlier um, this evening. My friend has a cast iron 1920s Victor. Nice. Uh, I'm sure you know that Victor was uh, done by Griswold, so congratulations on that. Channel shows the entire experience, flaws and all. Well, <laughs> Well, it helps me have confidence cooking. Well, again, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. And I'm more than, and again, it's very flattering. And, and that's part of the thing I like to hear, actually. I mean, I mean, as I said, I love having people here to, to watch as I make these attempts at cooking. And what I think the best compliment I can receive from any of you folks is to hear that you are actually trying some of the stuff that I, that I cook. So thank you so much for that. That one chip challenge is what? Oh, okay. Coming in late, who's eating their new, the new Pepper X? Pepper X, hotter than the Cal Carolina Reaper. Uh, I am not up on my uh, on my hot spices, I'm afraid. I don't have a lot of information on that, unfortunately. So um, I know a little bit more about the cast iron, at least a little bit, than the, uh, than the Pepper X. So 
But anyway, um, yeah, as I mentioned already, this is in fact a Red Mountain series um, number 12 lid. And that's one of the reasons why I'm looking for a Red Mountain pot to match it, which uh, would be a really nice score. Okay, Debbie, I'm sorry I'm late. Cooking like uh, crazy, nearly done. Well, congratulations. And hello, Debbie. Nice to have you here as well. But uh, yeah, um, so anyway, as I said, yes, cauldrons are, of course, again, went out of favor for the most part in the, uh, by the time of the uh, either Great Depression or almost certainly by World War II, but I'm thinking more likely by the Great Depression or so. Um, but they, uh, I mean, no, they are still indeed continuing to make uh, cast iron cauldrons, although, of course, not in the United States. So pretty much anything newer than that, if you want a really big cast iron pot, yeah, you have to go for the uh, Asian-made ones, um, like it or not. But the uh, Le Creuset one, as well, as I mentioned already, I'd had that for uh, about nine years or so until the uh, enamel on that finally started um, chipping. And so at that point, it was necessary to... Um, uh, to uh, get another big pot because I really like that pot. I mean, I've made a lot of great pasta sauce among other things in that pot. And that's why, in fact, in my kitchen, I do have now from Stobe a 13-quart uh, uh, Dutch oven that's about, that's really the same size as that uh, Le Creuset pot. So I'm quite happy about that. Judy W., I cooked in my stove today just as good as Le Creuset. Um, and as far as I know, it is in fact pronounced stove, not staub or staub, because, and that's what I thought as well, until I actually went onto their own website and saw that they are pronouncing it stove. And so that's why I, uh, call, that's why I, uh, call it that. I noticed that Lodge is doing enamel cast now. Looks fabulous. Yeah, I know. I have to say it's really tempting, isn't it? Yeah, they actually built their own enamelware foundry. So they are the first major enamel cast iron uh, manufacturer in the USA now in decades. And so, of course, you know, naturally building an enamelware foundry, especially in the present era, is was a, a hugely expensive undertaking for Lodge. So they're taking something of a risk with it. And that's also the reason why the first uh, enamel cast iron that they produce has to be very expensive. Yeah, and that's why they're trying to compete with Le Creuset now. Because, well, obviously, you know, they have to uh, make their money back as quickly as possible. It is almost a given, of course, that as time goes on, they will be expanding their line of enamelware. Uh, I don't know if they're going to come out with less expensive enamelware, but they will almost certainly be doing more variety. And so I'm really curious as well to see what Lodge will be doing with that too. You no, know, Ricky, carpet burns will make it worse. Hmm. Uh, the Lodge enamel Dutch ovens are only about uh, $70 USC. Well, yes. Um, well, okay. For, yeah, for the last couple of decades, Lodge has been producing enamel Dutch ovens. Yes, those of course are made in China, and that is. And I've said this every week. You know, there's nothing wrong with Chinese uh, cast iron, and that's all I'll say about that. We don't have to go through it again, but <clears throat> it also meant that they are um, not quite as high quality as you might get from Le Creuset. There are actually physical reasons for that. My understanding is Le Creuset actually puts layers of their enamel on, something like five or six layers of enamel on each and every one of their pots, which is one reason why they are so high quality and so durable. Whereas typical Asian-made enamel where might only have perhaps one or two layers of enamel on them. As far as enamel cast iron goes, Lodge is still high quality. I have a, uh, an enameled Lodge Dutch oven myself that I've been using for the last three years or so. Um, but I really would have to think that their um, newer USA enamel line would have to be better quality than that. So which again is one reason why they're selling it so expensive. Um, I really need to uh, make, make the effort. Oh, I did forget something. I forgot one other thing. 
mushrooms. I forgot the mushrooms. Okay, so let me open this thing up and we will uh, take it. We will see how it's doing right now anyway. Uh, it's not boiling yet. I can see some bubbles, but it's not quite at that point. Anyway, there we go. Here are the mushrooms. Okay, so let's mix these in. Although this is steaming nicely, so I'd say we are off to a good start. With any luck, this thing should actually start bubbling and boiling in about a few minutes or so. Thinking maybe I should throw in a little bit more water, perhaps, just to be safe. So let's do that. Run a little bit more hot water. I don't need too much more water, uh, but I would say I think I do want the water level to be a little, at least a little bit higher. There we go. That looks a little better. Okay. So let's throw this on. Where the heck is it? Where did I just put? Oh, I left the pot holder right here. Okay. There we go. But I interrupted my train of thought, and I apologize about that. But, yeah, I want to, I really need to, in fact, contact Lodge Cast Iron and see if the, if the opportunity will come up for me to actually talk with their engineering and production department and ask a few serious questions about the quality of their cast, of, of their enamel cast iron. Like, as I mentioned, how many layers of enamel do they put on, for instance? So the mushrooms will give off some water. Well, there is that, too. Needs about a tablespoon of mar marmite. Unfortunately, I don't have that. I've never actually gotten marmite. I have a burrow enamel Dutch oven that I love. Well, congratulations, Pat Z. And yes, it's true. Burrow Furnace has also been making enamel cast iron. Um, for at least the last few years, if I understand right. The difference, of course, is that Burrow is a very small company. And in fact, they, make, they do everything by hand. They make all of their cast iron by hand, which means, of course, it's good quality and it's high quality. It also means, of course, that, they, that it, it is also very, very expensive. But more importantly, it means that Burrow Furnace will never be able to mass produce their cast iron into any to any uh, in any way that they would be able to comp uh, compete with Lodge. So they are always going to be a very small niche company. And more power to them, and I hope they do fine. But um, that's why Lodge producing enamel cast iron is a huge development as far as cast iron in the United States is concerned. But uh, congratulations and best of luck to both of them, to Burrow Furnace and to Lodge. I don't mind hot, but I ain't gonna uh, get my breath took away. I still haven't been able to eat ketchup since I've had COVID. It takes my breath. Oh, I'm sorry to hear about that, Debbie. Um, I can't offer any advice about that. I mean, I'm not a doctor and I don't know your personal uh, health history. The best I can say is uh, consult with your doctor about that. He might be able to do things like maybe an exercise regimen. My brother also got COVID, and he really was hit bad by it, too. It almost, yes, he did almost pass away from it. He was seriously at the point where he was considering the possibility that he might not survive. But he did, thank goodness. And... It, it took him a month of uh, recovery before he could actually uh, get out of bed. And then for the longest time, he could barely even walk across the room without having breathing difficulty. But he got into an exercise regimen to uh, help you know, get back into shape and to bring his health back. And, it's, and it works, too. So he now jogs a good couple of miles every day which is something I've never been able to do. So he was able to uh, recover from it. 
Judy W., I have a 6.75 quart Le Creuset Risotto Pop and a 7.5 quart Le Creuset Soup Pop. Nice, and congratulations on that. Hey, clock some, Grizz some Griswold are way overpriced. Well, yes, they are. <laughs> um, yeah, look on eBay if you want to find overpriced Griswold, that's for sure. Mayan, um, Celine 77. <clears throat> My enamel log six quart Dutch oven was maybe 50 bucks on sale on Amazon. And congratulations on that. And I have no doubt you were getting a lot of use out of it. So that was a very good investment. Same here. I don't think another cast iron can compete with even the, even the new expensive stuff. I would take Griswold first. Well, that may be, I guess, a matter of preference. I mean, I mean, I know everybody loves vintage cast iron because of their history, and so do I. I mean, that's why first thing I do when I cook is I reach for my vintage pans, like the, like this one, for instance, or my BSR uh, skillets as well. Yet, the new cast iron that I've, that I've been lucky enough to acquire in one way or another, you know, like the uh, Modern Day Lodge or the uh, Stargazer or Field, uh, or even butter pat. Uh, I certainly have no complaints about cooking with those. That's for sure. <laughs> it takes my it takes my breath like drinking vinegar. It takes my breath. Ooh. I have a 1970s lodge. Uh, says one. I have a 1970s lodge, and should I buy the Victor 1920s? Well, it well number one if you can afford it, but more importantly, number two. If you feel you have a use for it, that's the thing that I have to ask myself all the time when I find a really impressive piece of cast iron. Do I really need it? I mean, I have so many skillets and Dutch ovens right now that the answer to that would almost always be no. So, I mean, it certainly helps. It certainly keeps me from spending a hundred or two hundred dollars on a uh, on another uh, Griswold uh, Dutch oven, for instance. I don't because I don't need it because I already have my Dutch ovens here. Uh, likewise, just the other day, in fact, on or was it yesterday? I saw a really great deal on eBay for a B Birmingham Stove and Range uh, flat bottom pot Century Series. The guy was only charging was only asking twenty five bucks for it. And uh, a reasonable shipping cost as well. And I was sorely tempted because I don't have a flat bottom pot. But I decided I don't need a flat bottom pot because I've got all my Dutch ovens. So I reluctantly had to turn it down. And instead, I posted the link to it on my Facebook. And by last night, evidently someone had bought it. So congratulations to them. <laughs> so. All right, what else do we have here? I just killed the seasoning in that smithy. Steaks and gravy. Well, you're doing, okay, Huey, you're doing exactly what you should do, namely cook with it. I mean, you could either leave it in pristine condition or you could actually use it. And I certainly, and as Val just says here, you don't regret the price if you can use it a lot. Yes, exactly. That's, that's the thing there. Bass Pro Cabela's Shop. Uh, still sell, no, sell Blacklock. Oh, they do. Well, can, well, I'm glad to hear that. All right, but what was that? I got a Griswold waffle maker about a month ago, and it makes really, and it really makes good waffles that actually taste better to me than waffles from an electric one. Yeah, I suppose it's possible. I mean, I consider, you know, I mean, even though, even though it's essentially just heating it up, um, I would think that, yeah, there could very well be a difference in taste. Um, so, I mean, I, I've enjoyed using my waffle maker as well. So I certainly, uh, again, will not uh, disagree with that. You did tell your friend of mine caught COVID at the same gathering I did, and she now has long COVID. Ouch. And again, I'm very sorry to hear that, Judy. But yeah, um, all we can do, of course, is offer condolences. And, um, well, everybody be careful. That's really what best I could say. That's why I'm glad I got my booster shots as well. I've been about a month ago, I got 
a triple shot. I got my flu shot, my COVID booster, and my shingle shot. <laughs> okay, Val's Black Hats rules. I did gravy in my uh, WAPAC, WAPAC, no, not WAPAC, WAPAC or WAPAC, and wiped it out right away, and it wiped out with butter. Seasoning is still good. Well, there, we, then there we go. That means what we need to do. Yeah, that gravy probably helps. That's for sure. But the bit, but really to uh, keep up with the uh, seasoning, of course, you want to cook something nice and greasy in it. And that's uh, because yeah, that certainly helps with the uh, seasoning. At this point, I think I can at least see how this is doing, and it's unfortunately still not boiling yet. Regrettably, I hope I didn't take too long. I've actually turned the uh, heat up a little bit on my uh, st on my stove top here. It's of course that this is a big pot and there's a lot of heavy food in there. So naturally, it's going to take a while before it gets to the real really gets to the boiling point. I can only hope this thing is done in time for this live to finish. Um, I know one at one point I made South African um, bunny chow and that was done in time. Well, okay, no need to panic. Anyway, rights Trump policy. I finally got my first Griswold. It's a number three, which is my favorite size skillet. And it's an Erie, Pennsylvania 709. It has some small pitting, but will cook great. Yes, it will. I have no doubt about that. Celine 77 cast iron makes everything taste better. My cast iron gym pan. Cornbread muffins turned out way better than an aluminum muffin pan. Well, yeah, that's all that I would not also not disagree with. And that, of course, has to do with how what good cast iron is at retaining heat. Aluminum is great for a number of things, but cast iron is great at a number of things as well. <laughs> I just I just got me a Griswold cast iron waffle maker. It makes the best I ever tasted. Yeah, that crust. Yes, exactly. The crust is one thing you can get in cast iron that really doesn't work as well with aluminum. So that's why there are a lot of things I would certainly prefer to cook in cast iron. Um, let, let's see. You know, aluminum, I've said enough times already. My aluminum Dutch oven is a great rice cooker. But if I want to make a casserole with rice and get that lovely crust of rice pagao, I would certainly reach for cast iron first if, if we want the uh, cr the rice crust. I also have a Griswold number 1727 star trivet, but I forget it. I forget it's a Griswold. <laughs> yeah. I've never even seen one. Elsie's cat. Uh, Cynthia Wesley, I'm to, uh, Debbie. Uh, I bet you have a few uh, way packs. Um, yeah, I had a Waypack griddle, and I forget if I ended up selling it. I think I did. I think I sold it at a flea market a few years ago. And then there was the time I actually managed to find a number 12 Waypack uh, skillet, and I got that for three bucks at a flea market. That was a good score. I ended up trading away that number 12 Waypack because, once again, I really did not have a use for it. I'm trying to remember what I traded it for. I believe, in fact, I think that's what I traded. Uh, that's how I got this uh, Red Mountain number 12 lid, if I remember right. I believe I traded that way pack for, that, uh, for this lid here. Uh, you should do a shepherd's pie one day. Oh, you know, I'll draw more Brit viewers. That sounds good. And as a matter of fact, I do have some lamb in the, uh, in the freezer. So I could indeed make a shepherd's pie. Ha, ha, ha. As folks know, uh, I, you folks probably know in Britain, shepherd's pie means lamb, whereas cottage pie means beef. Because, of course, you know, after all, shepherds, you know, they, they herd sheep. Whereas, um, yeah, beef, on the other hand, <laughs> was uh, more for, I guess, for uh, people who live in cottages? I don't know. Okay, Judy, oh my goodness, I'm not sure, it's been a while. Do you have a Facebook account? Uh, poor man's pie for sure. Eh, nothing wrong with poor man's food, that's for sure. You know, that's the thing. When people talk about poor man's recipes, you know, a lot of those poor people's recipes really uh, ended up becoming uh, useful and tasty and long-lived. Li long 
I mean, after all, you know, it was, I mean, it certainly, it would not have been the rich and the elite who thought of things like coca ven, for instance, chicken stewed in wine, or for that matter, grits, um, you know, from the good old grits from down south and probably not even cornbread, you might even say. Poor man's recipes become comfort food. Yes, they do. And I love them myself. Mac and cheese, uh, any number of ways to make chicken, for instance. Everybody has an opinion, but my feeling is the BSR outperforms the Griswold when it comes to cooking. Cast Iron Fanatic, you know, I tend to agree with you on that, but that, that's because I think I tend to prefer the thicker, heavier cast iron, such as BSR or Lodge, as opposed to the thinner cast iron like Griswold. I mean, I have several Griswold skillets, and I still do my best to use them on a regular basis as well, such as my number 10 Griswold, for instance. But again, for a lot of things, I will probably reach for my uh, modern day lodge or my uh, vintage BSR first before uh, doing my, uh, yeah, before uh, reaching for the Griswold because it is thicker and heavier. And I do think it does a better job at things like searing meat, for instance. Corey Clark, 37, yeah, 37 degrees this weekend. It's um something time. I'm afraid it's kind of being, I'm afraid my chat is being blocked. It's chili time. Yes, exactly. Or gumbo time for that matter. They say down south when it gets chilly, you make gumbo. And I'm certainly looking forward to doing that next week. Squirrel pot pie. Yeah, I could do that. I uh, love my Wagners over my Griswold for cooking most things, and I love my BSRs. Welcome to the club. <laughs> uh, of course, um, does anybody have any Western Foundry Meepet? Really? Meepet? That's interesting. Uh, Western Foundry Meepet cast iron. If so, how do you like it? I have never owned a Meepet. I've seen a few of them once in a while in my travels at uh, various... Uh, antique malls and at Brimfield. Um, the meat pet, from what I saw, really looks kind of like what you might see in BSR and, um, and Lodge, in that it actually looked fairly thick, which, as we've just been saying here, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. Would it still be called a cottage pie if it was made with venison? Um, I would say no. There's probably another term for a uh, venison pot pie, but I don't know what it is. Um, so I might even have to look that up because I'm I, because I know venison was so popular for the longest time, and actually the few times I've had venison, I loved it as well. It's very tasty. So yeah, um, yeah. Of course, you know. Uh, Food, in, I mean, the availability of food really has changed from the old days to the new days. I mean, in the old days, for instance, um, chicken was not an everyday cheap meat. I mean, yes, people kept chickens for eggs, of course, but they did not eat them on a regular basis, just when they got old and had to be, had to be slaughtered. Uh, on the other hand, on... Oh, good. It looks like this um, looks like this thing is uh, I'm beginning to boil because I'm beginning to see steam here. So let's take a look. And yes, we are successful. It is boiling now, finally. Actually, it looks like it's boiling too much in one side. I think I better move this over more towards the center. There we go. All right. So anyway, what was I just saying? Oh, yeah, that's right. Chicken was not an everyday meat. And, you know, I only realized that recently, and especially when I learned about city chicken, which I, I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago. City chicken is actually just pork, you know, fried the way you fry chicken, and they just call it city chicken. But anyway, um, on the other hand, very common in everyday meats back then were things like pigeon or squab or duck or goose, you know, things that they, that they could hunt and uh, kill just about any day of the week. 
So in those days, of course, you know, duck was, was commonplace, goose was commonplace. These days, on the other hand, duck is a delicacy. You can go to the supermarket, for instance, and get yourself a uh, and get yourself a frozen duck for something like, oh, I don't know, 20 bucks or so. And I've done so because when prepared right, duck is really tasty. When not prepared right, duck is really gamey. <laughs> Uh, my first time having duck, in fact, was at a restaurant and was poorly prepared. It had a gamey taste to it. But yes, I mean, that. but my point is just that, that, you know, food availability really has changed over the years. And uh, we have the change in society, I guess, to thank or blame for it, uh, which is kind of like then we can get on into how you know, of course, processed foods these days really pretty much trump just about anything like that. And that's why there are so many people these days who simply have never cooked in their lives and would not be able to cook, whether it's chicken or duck. I mean, I've already told my story as well about how for most of my life, I was one of those people who I would have told you that I could not cook to save my life. And our freezer in those days was full of Walmart microwave pizzas and burritos and pot pies. But I'm th I am so glad that I learned how to cook and have been able to try so many foods, such as duck and goose. Uh, about 10 years ago for Christmas, I cooked a goose because I wanted to see what it was like. Goose, as I found out, is all dark meat. Uh, even the breast is dark meat, but I guess that's because they don't raise geese for uh, as um, you know as a uh, food bird the way they do chickens. But I I liked it for that reason. Goose definitely had a taste of its own, and it yes, squab is is a pigeon. Yes, it is. So, um, but uh, it had a taste all of its own. I it did not taste like chicken. And yes, I liked it. I there was really no way for me to describe it any more than you can say that a duck tastes like chicken. Duck does not taste like chicken. It has its own flavor. Never tried goose. Not a dark meat fan, though. Well, I hope I haven't put you off of it. But nonetheless, uh, in the twenties, I ate frozen oven food mostly and frozen pot stickers. Yes, exactly, Huggy Bear. I was in that uh, same boat as well. So, the aluminum lids are wonderful. I use them with my cast iron pans, especially Wagner Drip Drop number. Okay, but yes, indeed, I actually went and got a uh, huge fifteen-inch aluminum lid, especially to go on my number fourteen size pan. My 14 size skillets. Uh, and I'm very glad that I did because they are very convenient. There's no question about that. I've had Wawa Canada goose chili. Worst part was ca cathing, oh, catching. Oh, I get it. Was eating the occasional piece of shot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can my sis Tracy get a shout out? Oh, yes. Hello, Tracy, over there in England. De Beaumont resident told me, told us already that you folks are watching it there in England. So again, it's very nice to uh, hear to uh, see you folks in England. Well, I can't see you, but rather the fact that you are seeing this is again a very flattering, and I'm very pleased to see you here. So hello, Tracy, and and De Beaumont resident. So thank you very much, and I do hope. Um, you, I hope you've enjoyed my channel, even though I know it's not easy to stay up until midnight just to watch these, uh, live videos. So thank you so much for that. I've seen buckshot made out of spices, easier on the teeth. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, pre people would often, for instance, put salt in a shotgun. Uh, my theory, my reason, the understanding, not my theory, but my understanding is, was that is that using salt from a shotgun would not be fatal. And so it would be a good way to uh, get intruders off of your property without killing them. My ex went dove hunting every September. I was tasked with draining the blood, fucking feathers, and getting the shot out, then cooking. He would never eat a bite of it. <laughs> My condolences, Clicquot. On the other hand... Of course, there are turkeys. 
where, um, you know, the, the great American bird, uh, where people can still go and, and hunt turkeys even today if they want to. Whereas, of course, most of us simply just buy our turkeys at the store. <laughs> I have not yet had a uh, freshly uh, caught turkey like that. I have only eaten my turkeys frozen and thawed out. And I've enjoyed them very much. And yeah, we're getting into turkey time too, folks. <laughs> okay, would like to hear some cast iron cooking recipes with beer. I homebrew. I have a dark wheat beer going. Okay, Mark Sieber, here's one for you. Consider this. Get to, uh, chicken stewed in beer. Namely, as you know, a lot of uh, recipes for chicken often call for things like white wine, for instance. Or for that matter, there's coca vin which is chicken stewed in a uh, red wine, a Pinot Noir. Well, uh, I, have, I have seen recipes that actually use beer instead of, um, uh, instead of wine uh, for chicken. And that certainly turns out well. So consider that. Like, for instance, take a home, like, for instance, take a, a recipe for Coco Vin and instead of using the, uh, instead of using the wine, use beer and see what you come up with. Or for that matter, one of my favorite cakes to bake, and I bake this every year, beer cake. And that's where you simply take your cake batter and normally where you would simply add like, yeah, I think it's buttermilk. Yeah, I believe it's instead of buttermilk um, to your cake batter, you simply add beer. And, and as a result, you get yourself a very light, and fluffy cake because, of course, you know, the head and bubbles from the beer. So I do that every year. That's right. On Cinco de Mayo, you know, the beer festival day. And I love making a beer cake for that. So you asked about beer recipes. There are here. There are a couple for you. So I hope that helps. They are farm raised for a reason. I saw about six wild turkeys this past weekend in a national forest. <laughs> I've had wild turkey. I would imagine it'd be like wild, wild chicken, tough, grisly, grisly, and dry. Well, there is that. And just for the record, I am not, absolutely not going into going to get into the debate over uh, humane treatment of uh, animals or cage free or anything like that. I am quite simply not interested in it. And if that subject comes up, I'm going to change the subject. Question all, says Huggy Bear. Vintage or modern high-end cast iron? I want, the cat, I want the vintage route, but mostly stargazers. Those stargazers have always looked like awesome pans, and those Lancasters look as, look as close to a classic Griswold. Well, the answer to that is yes. <laughs> I have both. I have modern-day cast iron, and I have vintage cast iron. And I love them both, and they both cook great. If you want some, if you want a modern day Griswold, you can get yourself a field skillet, for instance, or that Lancaster. Uh, I have a stargazer and I love it. And I've been doing my best to use my stargazer regularly for the uh, past three or so years that I've had it. Or is it four years? You'll have four years already. <laughs> so, um, okay. The Beaumont resident. By ch uh, any chance we could do a show on the taste of Louisiana, case in point, the muffaletta, uh, the muffalata. Oh, yeah, I've, I've seen that. Um, I've never made a muffalata, which means I guess I'll have to try making it. That all sounds good. But as far as the taste of Louisiana goes, well, I am making gumbo next week. I hope that helps. Have you ever used a spider frying pan? Um, yes, I have. I never, I never fried with it, uh, but I did, in fact, use it pretty much the same way as a Dutch oven. You know, because it had legs, I've used it for cold cooking. In fact, I have that spider sitting over here right now on my shelf, the BSR camp spider. So I'm uh, quite happy about that. Oh, actually, at this point, I forgot. I've got one more thing to do, and that means I better get started on it right now. Okay, and that is... Let's, let's turn the camera around. This is going to be very simple and very easy, though. Ugh. And the last thing I need to do is a pumpkin. 
as I said, this is pumpkin stew. Um, and as I mentioned already, and as you saw in the recipe before, I what I did was I just barely um, browned that stew, and then I put it in the pumpkin, and then roasted the whole thing in the oven. And that took a long time. That actually ended up taking a few hours before it was completely done. So that's why I took this other route tonight, namely that I, uh, I'm i uh, going to uh, simply do the stew and put it in the pumpkin. However, uh, right now I am going to um, just simply at least partially cook this pumpkin in the oven so that it won't be raw when the stew goes into it. And besides, by partially cooking it, then this should still be a sturdy pumpkin and it won't come apart when we put the stew in it, or at least that's my hope. So let's do this as best as I can. And the only way I can think of doing this is quite simply using my hand. But there's an excuse to uh, dip, break out another piece of cast iron. Say hello to the Wagner Chicken Fryer, the number nine completely unmarked Wagner Chicken Fryer. But we know it's a Wagner because it has this circular uh, hanging hole here. And so... Let's take this. Yeah, I already hollowed out the pumpkin, though, uh, rather than wasting everybody's time in the live. So let's do this. We simply put it on. And let's start with, um, oh, yeah, I did wash it off. Let's start uh, putting some olive oil on here. But one thing I've also found about roasting pumpkins, it's perfectly okay to have a pumpkin that has these blemishes on it. Uh, because the blemishes are only are only on the surface, and they actually, uh, you know, they don't penetrate uh, further down. So there's nothing wrong with using a blemished pumpkin in, if you are going to be going that route. Anyway, let's coat this thing with uh, olive oil as best as I can. And really, the olive oil is more for color than anything else, because as I said, I'm only going to partially cook this pumpkin. And because of that, I'm going to leave it open so that we can at least get a little bit of heat on the inside as well. And now the uh, co the cover as well, just a little bit on there. There we go. And now that we've done that, I better rinse off my hands very quickly. I'm hoping to have all of this done maybe in about 30 minutes. I guess it really depends on how quickly that stew can do. Uh, I mean, it doesn't take too long really to boil squash, so it's entirely possible that it could still be done in time. That's my hope. But let's uh, move over once again to the oven which I have already preheated, by the way, to 350 degrees. And in it goes. Ugh. Yes, as you can see, there's a cast iron uh, griddle in the oven. And also the, li the uh, lid. There we go. All right. Now we're just, I'm just going to leave that in for like maybe about 20 to 30 minutes at most. Okay, so now that we've done that, there's one other thing I need to do, and that's consider thickening this stew here. So right about now, let's throw some extra flour in to the, into uh, the pot and at least partially thicken up the stew somewhat. Oh, yeah, this thing is boiling very nicely, which is another good reason to cook in cast iron, that's for sure. All right. So, yeah, this thing is actually, I'd say there is still a chance that this could very well be done, I hope. All right, that's good. And I'm not getting, I'm not seeing any signs of any burning on the bottom. So, uh, things are looking pretty good, which means now let's just stir in some flour, shall we? That's probably enough. And then I will cover it again, and we will just continue from there. 
that was, oh, I don't know, maybe three quarters of a cup of flour, perhaps. As you can see, I didn't exactly measure. But let's get as much of it mixed in as possible. Okay. I hope I don't just end up with dumplings. Well, on the other hand, dumplings may not be that bad either. But now that we've done that, let's cover this once again and let it do its thing. Ugh. See how it all turns out. Okay, where was I? Anyone else wonder why Lodge got rid of the Blacklock 14-inch skillet? I can only guess. May not have sold very well. <laughs> because unfortunately, yeah, there's no denying it was an expensive piece of cast iron. Um, maybe not so much compared to other elite cast iron pans. Um, but what was the price that they were selling it for? Um, was it $150? Was it $200? I'm not sure. So that may perhaps, people just must not have been buying the number 14 Blacklock. And I guess I can understand that. I mean, after all, um, there is a reason for buying a huge cast iron pan like that. Oh, 100? Wow. That thing would make a great turkey roaster. 100? That's actually a lot more reasonable price than I would have expected. So now I am surprised. Because, of course, you know, these days they're selling vintage number 14 cast iron skillets, even lodges, for more than $100. Okay, can you show the underside of your lid for the drip parts? The old ones had several ways to make the lid drip from spikes. Um, which lid are you referring to? I do have a smaller BSR lid, if you'd like, and I can bring that out for you. Uh, and then I think I will also bring out a lodge lid just to compare. So let's dig out this BSR and this lodge. Here we are. Okay. As you have asked, here are a couple of lids. Back this up a little bit. Here is a, an unmarked lodge lid that I managed to uh, come across. Uh, because it's unmarked, it's really hard to date this. Uh, this is a lodge lid with the basting spikes on the bottom, and it says 10 and a quarter and a number eight. So this thing could be anywhere from, oh, I don't know, 20, 30, 50 years old, perhaps. I am really not good at dating lodge lids, so I would not be able to tell you how old this is. But yes, here are the basting spikes uh, on the bottom. The, the way it works, as I understand it, is that condensation collects on the bottom of the lid and it drips off the spikes onto the food. And that's why they are, oops, I was too low there. And that's why, and that's why there are spikes underneath the lid. Oh dear, where did all this hair show up on this? <laughs> I'm gonna have to wash this off. On the other hand, um, over on this end, we have a vintage Birmingham stove and range number eight lid and the, and BSNR lids did not have spikes on the bottom. Instead, they had these dimples on the bottom. And you know, I never really understood that because, uh, I am assuming it was for the same idea, but they're not they're higher up than the rest of the surface rather than low maybe perhaps it might have caused condensation to drip off more evenly perhaps um i'm not sure i may actually have to question that or, or ask somebody's opinion on that but anyway this is a bsnr red mountain series lid with the uh dimples apparently put on at random so and they continued like this until they went for automated production in the 1960s. Oh, yeah, actually, let me show you one other thing. This particular one also has one of those little errors 
that they often made during production in B at BSR. You know, because instead of saying 8F, this one says F8. And so, but it's still definitely a Red Mountain series uh, lid. All right. So, as you asked, I have a Canadian-made lid that has raised zigzags. Um, yeah, some of the other uh, manufacturers as well, they, they used ridges instead of spikes or dimples underneath their lids. So uh, some of them were in pretty uh, fancy patterns as well, which is why I can also dig out for you, for you folks another lid. And here it comes right now, such as... Here's a Griswold lid, a Griswold number eight self basting skillet cover. And this particular, and Griswold, as we know, did not have spikes. They had these rings all around the inside. And there are, are a number of unmarked Griswold lids that were all, that uh, also have these same, that has the same pattern here. And in fact, if you come across any lid with this circular pattern underneath, yeah, then it's likely a Griswold, whether or not it actually has the Griswold logo on it. And then let me see, under my collection of lids here. Oh, yeah, then here's another popular one. In fact, it came from the Wagner Chicken Fryer, no less. And that, of course, is a Wagner lid. And this Wagner lid here is best known for having this sawtooth. Uh, they, they, while it does have a circular pattern, much like Griswold, the, uh, this interesting sawtooth or these ridges here uh, were all along, the, uh, all along the rim as well. And this likely served the same purpose as probably the lodge basting spikes. So... But that also makes it very easy to identify a uh, Wagner lid as well. So there we go. We've got, there are four lids for you. We've had Lodge, BSR, Griswold, and Wagner. Beth, cold liquid and flour or cornstarch. You shake it smooth and pour it in. Oh, oh, I see. You're probably talking about maybe I should have done a slurry rather than just simply putting uh, flour in there, make a cornstarch slurry, yeah. You know, I, I probably didn't even think about, think about that. Uh, does that Dutch oven you were cooking with have fire damage? Answer is yes, it does, I'm sorry to say. Um, this definitely is a fire damaged pot. Uh, in fact, I managed to acquire two of these at the same time, and they probably came from the, the same house or home that had a house fire uh the other one now these are bo both of these were warped this thing is definitely warped and it spins like a top the other one though spun even worse and unfortunately the other one did not hold seasoning at all so i simply was not able to use that other one this one on the other hand i'm i'm betting you can even see the discoloration even now uh, so yes, it is true. This is in fact a fire damaged pot, but because I was able to season this pot, um, it, I'm still trying to get as much use out of it as possible because it's a number 12 Dutch oven and I, and I love using a number 12 Dutch oven. It is also possible that at some point in the future, this pot is going to crack. It could happen in the next five minutes or the next five years or never. And let me see. It looks like, yeah, there are still clumps of flour in there as well. So, you know, you're right. I did not even think of that. I probably indeed should have made a slurry and mixed it in that way. That was my own fault. Okay. Nonetheless, my number eight has BSR has some fire damage, but it was my first skillet, so I don't want to get so I don't want to get rid of it. And I don't blame you at all for that huggy bear. My favorite lids are the beehive style, like O'Brien, Me Pet, easy to clean. Oh, I've seen those. Yeah, those are neat looking lids, that's for sure. I don't seem to have a problem with the seasoning on my lids. Oh, you are doing good there. As long as it works, that's all that matters. Well, yes, that's true. 
And I intend to get as much use as possible out of this um, pot. It's entirely possible it could last me the rest of my life. And I'm hoping it does, unless I manage to get lucky and as I've already wind enough and acquire a Red Mountain number 12. Seasoning won't stick. Maybe no, maybe my seasoning has fire damage. <laughs> well, hopefully not. Because, yeah, that's one of the biggest reasons why we, we tell folks, don't clean your cast iron in a fire. And boy, does that ever cause arguments. And it is still causing arguments. There are people right now on... Um, TikTok and YouTube making videos showing how they clean cast iron in a fire. Well, it's their cast iron and they can do whatever they want with it. And that's all I'm going to say. Press the lumps through a strainer to incorporate or enjoy as unintentional dumplings. Yeah, I'm guessing I'm going to have to do it that way. That's for sure. Uh, the other thing I could do, of course, now that this thing is boiling nicely, uh, I could very well just take the lid off and let it boil down. Let, let it reduce a little bit. Maybe I will do so. Although, on the other hand, I'm not sure if, the, if this is starting to soften yet. Certainly hope so. Um, you know what? As a matter of fact, look at this. Here's a piece of pumpkin right here. Let's try to get a little bit closer here. Uh, let me dig out a piece of squash, this pumpkin. Well, we're off to a good start, that's for sure. Of course, squash really doesn't take very long to cook, so that's a good sign. There we go. Better stir it around so that it doesn't burn and stick to the bottom. That was the squash. More importantly, let's check out one of these potatoes and see what it's like. And, well, well, the potato is getting close to fork tender. So, you know, we may very well be in luck. Because between the potato and the squash, um, you know, I think we may very well make it. And we may very well have all of this ready by the uh, end of this, by the end of this video here. Nice. So yeah, I think I will just leave it leave it off at this point and see if we can boil, see if we can reduce some of this uh, liquid somewhat and try to thicken the stew up that way. But hey, on the whole, I don't think we're doing too badly. Meanwhile, on the other hand, in the oven, uh, let me turn on the oven light and. Here comes another roller coaster ride, folks. If you don't like it, you can look away. Let's take a look, if we can, at that pumpkin. Come on. Yeah, I know. My glass is not very clean, unfortunately. I've been trying to clean it. But this pumpkin is looking not too bad, not too shabby either. So you know what? I do believe we may very well... Uh, be successful, and we might indeed have the stew ready uh, within, what would you say, maybe the next 20 minutes or so? I mean, after all, it is 25 past now, so normally I'd be calling it a night, but I do want to try to finish this. How about we check it in 15 minutes and see um, whether this uh, may be considered done? And yeah, I'm feeling a little bit of roughness on the bottom too. So I've got to be careful here. As I said, I really don't want this to burn. Um, what's this? Oh, okay. I'm seeing, I'm seeing dark spots here. At first I thought those were burn bits, but those are actually the mushrooms. So I'd say we're not doing too badly. You know what I should probably do then? I should probably taste the stew and see how it's turning out. <laughs> what a concept. Uh, let's, dig, let's dig something out here. And see what the stew is like.
Mm. Mm. Well, I can taste it. Oh, yeah. There's cayenne in it. I can taste the heat. I can taste the curry. So this is not going to be a bland stew, that's for sure. My my uh, friend again, I've not mentioned her name yet because, well, um, I don't like, you know, using people's real names on the internet for privacy reasons. You know, people, it's too easy. And right now, people, of course, can get spam or be harassed if they use their real names online. So I would prefer not to use a person's real name. And in fact, I should ask my friend to uh, tell me what kind of nickname I should call her with. That's why I like, I love you folks here, like Rocket Caver or, or um, Celine 77. Because again, there's no need to use your real name on the internet. As you know, I mean, privacy is an illusion, especially on the internet. So guard whatever privacy you can. All right. If that means I'm an anarchist, then so be it. Still, this is actually looking pretty darn good. And you know, I'm not really seeing much of those uh, dumplings in here. So I think maybe the flour might even be incorporating into this. So yeah, if, it's, if you think I'm liking how this has turned out, yes, I'm liking how this is turning out. Maybe this might inspire somebody to give it a try because, yeah, pumpkin stew. We've got the weekend before Halloween coming up. This is something you may want to make for your Halloween party or gathering or whatever you are going to be doing this weekend. All right. Anyway, Huey Brian, I want a 17-inch Yellowstone pan for the August challenge. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, a Lodge Yellowstone. Well, there you go. You're probably going to have a collector's item there, that's for sure. It's also on the Lodge website under Recipe of the Month. It did seem to thicken up a bit. Some of the iron is just too old and worn out. Well, it, uh, the only way to wear out iron would unfortunately be to warp it or crack it, you know, from things like th use, throwing it in a fire, for instance. <laughs> the, the thin cast iron, of course, could tend to do that more than the thicker cast iron, which is one reason why older Griswold is so rare. Uh, because, yeah, it is actually hard to find, it's like, say, for instance, a slant logo Griswold number eight that actually sits flat and is not warped. All right. But, yeah, you know, I am quite happy with how this is turning out. This really wasn't so hard. The prep work took a long time because, of course, I had to cut up all that chicken, chop up all those tubers. That means I had to, actually had to chop up. And a pot and gut a pie pumpkin and then and then the potatoes and then the sweet potatoes. But once those as well as taking out that other pumpkin, and in fact, I think at this point I can probably take out that pumpkin because I don't want that pumpkin to be thoroughly cooked. Um, just enough so that it won't be raw. So that means let's turn away from this again. Oops. There we go. And it looks like I've got a mess to clean up. I got to get rid of these lids here. <laughs> so let's put these back. All right. Uh, yeah. I'm also glad that since I moved here, I have definitely gotten myself into the habit of cleaning up my mess as fast as possible. Because, of course, if I don't clean my mess up, no one will. So, yeah. All right, there we go. That takes care of that and that. And now, finally, let's get out the pumpkin, which means I got to get my gloves. All right, here we go. And Val's Black Cat says, it's always good to find a neighbor who cooks. Oh, yeah, congratulations. It's disgusting how many have had their identity taken from some scammer. Yes, that's exactly what I'm referring to. Um, let me see. Maybe I should, just to be safe, put it on a trivet. I mean, this is a granite countertop here, not a fake one, a real granite countertop. So I don't think it's likely that it could be damaged, but I, best to be safe. Okay. 
turn off the oven. And out comes, oh man, this is a nice sheen to it. I'll say that much. Check this out. Oh yeah, it's definitely hot too. Oh. oh yeah. In fact, you can even see some browning on the top. There we go. And I can feel it's soft on the inside, but definitely sturdy. So I think this will be a nice serving vessel for the stew. And the other part is, ugh, whoops. <laughs> the other part is the this part, which I actually put on the bare iron and it's uh, seared a little bit. So now I'm gonna have to clean that thing up. Well, then I'll have to do that because yeah. As I said, there was a griddle, there was a griddle in the oven already and it looks like it kind of cooked that pumpkin. Ooh, this is hot. Holy cow, this is hot. Wow. All right, back in the oven. Ugh. Okay. <laughs> I have not yet seriously injured myself on these YouTube lives, and I intend to keep it that way, I hope. But anyway, nice. So, yeah, it's, this is going to be a nice looking stew. I'll say that much. Definitely going to have to get some photos as soon as the uh, stew goes into there. All right. You said Walmart? <laughs> Dubs, just go to the bamboo garden around the corner and do a walk by and get you some chopsticks. <laughs> okay. Yes, exactly. William Hurt Chaos. <laughs> okay. Uh, was that a spork you used to taste? Yes, it was. I have shown this uh, off before, and I have it right over here. This is my favorite personal eating utensil. This is a titanium spork that uh, came from REI, the, the uh, sporting goods store. And this is probably going to last forever. It'll definitely outlive me, that's for sure. So yes. And this was only like 10 bucks as well. So this is a very much, I feel to be a lifetime investment. All right. Jimmy Langford, about five years ago, I passed on a Red Mountain number 12 Dutch oven. Oh, with a lid on the antique store. They had it priced at $150. I guess I should have picked it up. I've not found another one yet. Yeah, if you have a use for it, Jimmy Langford, I probably would say yes. But um, on the other hand, I am always saying as well that I feel that everybody should have at least one big cast iron pot. On the other hand, if you have since gotten yourself another big pot and you're using it, well, then I'd say you're doing fine. I mean, I have to admit, I'm only looking for a Red Mountain number 12, really for personal reasons. Because again, I already have a number of big cast iron pots. Besides this BSR number 12, I have my eight, my number three Poiki. I have my Stobe Dutch oven. I have my Bayou Classic 16-quart, 4-gallon Dutch oven. And, of course, I have that 15-gallon cauldron. So, really, I don't need a BSNR Red Mountain number 12. On the other hand, I would like a BSNR Red Mountain number 12. So, need versus want. We are getting down to that again. You know, I think this stew is actually turning out quite well. Let's let's turn the pot, uh, if you don't mind, let's turn the camera back over to the stew again. Here comes the roller coaster, folks. We. But check it out now. You know, I do believe it's working. I am not seeing any dumplings in this. I'm not seeing any flour clumps. It does look like it's actually incorporated in. You know, I do believe we might be successful. What's more, it looks like everything is coming apart, too. Let me, let's do this test one more time. Okay, here, uh, yeah, here's a uh, piece of squash, or is this potato? Uh, this potato, um, I think it's potato. Yeah, you can, it's hard to tell, but it looks like it's definitely coming apart. There's definitely chew to it, but it's certainly not too chewy. 
The chicken, on the other hand, is also coming apart. You know what? I think this stew is done. I think we did it. All right. Oh, so there we go. SMT, catch me if you can. You were correct on the titanium spork. I thought you were making a joke. Oh, no, it, it, that is a real titanium spork, and I love it. All right. But, hey, look like we got it, folks. I'm going to turn off the, the, the flame, in fact, because this is cast iron. It's going to stay hot for a long time. Of course, now I've got the question of how am I going to get this into the pumpkin? Oh, that actually, that's not so hard. What we need to do now is simply put, the, put that uh, chicken fryer over here. Um, there we go. See, William Hurt, I'm being careful. All right. Take, move this out of the way. Put the chicken fryer back over there. And at this point, I am glad I used the chicken fryer. That's for sure. Um, all right. Okay, come on. Uh, it's, an, it's a good thing this pumpkin's empty. There we go. All right, now I guess, even, uh, I'm not sure if I can raise this thing anymore, any higher than this. Uh, this tripod does have some limitations. Oh, there we go, that might help. Uh, I do believe, yeah, there we go. And I'm hoping it's not, I'm hoping it's not drowning, uh, the, bright, the light isn't drowning it out either. But biggest red mountain I have are 10s. You put that in the oven after you fill it. I could do that. There's certainly a plan for you. However, we can definitely say this uh, stew is done. Oh, yeah. And like I said, you see the blemishes are only on the surface, by the way. They don't go out in, down into the pumpkin. So that's why if you're going to roast a pumpkin, it's perfectly okay to use a uh, pumpkin with blemishes on it. But let's do this as best as we can. Oh, it's still hot, damn it. That means I better move this over a little bit. And move this over. There we go. In fact, I think we can, there we go. A little bit of both. And now we start scooping. Look at that, folks. In we go. Yes, indeed. So anyway, this, of course, is, I feel, would be a nice dish to make for Halloween, of course. Very, definitely very, you know, Halloween-y. Made in a cast iron cauldron, which, as I mentioned already, this is a cauldron. I'm not just using an excuse. The Dutch oven is indeed a modern-day cauldron. In fact, even New Age pagan witch, witchy folks, they regularly use their Dutch ovens as cauldrons. So, yes, I will definitely say we have made ourselves a Halloween potion in a cast-iron cauldron. Now, it's just a matter of filling it up. I guess I'm going to have to wash off the or wipe off the outside. It's kind of dripping, unfortunately. But we're not doing too badly. Maybe a couple more scoops. And there's actually a fair amount left over. Gee, gosh darn, we're going to have to have ourselves. But top it off with more liquid. And there we go. That um, finally, as I mentioned... Let me get, I guess, a paper towel and wipe that dripping stuff off the side. But there we are, folks. Here is our pumpkin stew. Ta-da! I definitely am going to have to get at least one or two uh, snapshots of this.
carve a face in it. Well, that kind of defeats the purpose. <laughs> maybe, maybe write a face onto it or something. Okay, here comes our camera. There we go. That's a nice, that's a nice shot. And up above, more from this direction. And finally, another shot of the pot itself. There we are, folks. So that means, I guess the best thing to say now is, once again, Happy Halloween. Because we have accomplished what we set out to accomplish tonight. And finally, one last thing. On goes the lid. Bam. All right. So there we go, folks. Can only thank everybody very much for your patience as you watched and commented. Uh, as we made our Halloween pumpkin stew. And this did not take several hours. I mean, the preparation, there was a lot of prep work, yes, probably a couple of hours worth of prep work from chopping up all those things. But, I mean, we only had to, as you saw, it only took uh, an hour and 40, maybe an hour and 30 minutes to actually do this. That's why I did it this way. You know, I, sep I uh, cooked this separately and filled the pumpkin with it. It took, a, it did not take several hours, but there we go. Here is our pumpkin stew, folks. And let's check our comments one last time. Exactly. That's how they're marketed here in Canada. Well, thank you very much as well, uh, Beth Button. And I see your bread bowl and I raise you a pumpkin bowl. Yes, exactly. Uh, I'm not, I love eating roasted pumpkin. And to be absolutely honest, I'm not sure if you could eat this because it may still be raw on the inside. But I'm hope I figure it's cooked enough. And as well, this hot stew will certainly help as well. So if nothing else, we're, there's definitely a lot of pumpkin in this stew. Carve a face and that's how people have to get their food. <laughs> well, there's one possibility for you. But nonetheless... Thank, well, thank you as well, Shadow Walker XM, and thank you, Val's Black Cat's Rules. Yes, I can only thank everybody for being kind enough to stay here all this time. But uh, there we go. This is indeed our pumpkin stew. And so, if nothing else, we've had another opportunity to talk about cast iron, cast iron cauldrons and lids and BSR and Griswold and, um, and modern day cast iron, and I'm very glad to do so. Uh, yeah, you know, because it seems like there's never any ending to uh, the, uh, the to the subject, um, and we, we'll probably continue doing this for a long time to come. And I certainly hope so, because these are a lot. It's a lot of fun. I mean, as I say every week, I mean, it's you folks here who really make this, uh, you know, who make these live videos so much fun. Uh, I love being able to uh, cook live here with you folks, uh, you know, really pretty much, if not cheering me on, then at least offering some lively commentary. Uh, just about all of it is certainly well-deserved, good and bad. So I can only thank you all for all of your comments and for being here and for enjoying my channel. And I can um, spread the word, I guess. And um, I'm very grateful to everybody. So we can wrap this up for the evening. As I mentioned, next Tuesday is Halloween, and I really want to do a gumbo. <clears throat> but that doesn't change anything in that next Wednesday is November 1st. And that, that means because it's the first Wednesday of the night, we will once again be doing a cast iron Q&A session, which is good because that means I don't have to do all of this prep work this time. I will just do my best to hold my end of the conversation as everybody throws questions and answers, and I'll be more than happy to enjoy our, our, myself along with everybody else. So thank you so much, everybody, for uh, hanging around and uh, enjoying this uh, Cast Iron Wednesday, and we will do it all over again next week. So have a good evening, folks. And as I like to say, as always, see you next Wednesday. <laughs>